Welcome to the State Bar of Texas podcast, your monthly source for conversations and curated content to improve your law practice with your host, Rocky Deer. Hello and welcome to the State Bar of Texas podcast recorded from the annual meeting in Austin, Texas. This is Sally Pretorius and Bailey Rhodes, and we are the host for today's show, which is being sponsored by LawPay, trusted by more than 35,000 law firms to accept legal payments online. It's the only payment solution offered as a member benefit by the State Bar of Texas. So joining me now, I have Bailey Rhodes, who's co-hosting with me, and we have Audrey Moorhead, Judge Audrey Moorhead, sorry. It's hard when you're friends first, and then your friends become big and important people. So welcome to the show. Before we get started about our topic today, Judge Moorhead, can you um, start by telling us a little bit more about yourself? Absolutely. I am a judge, and I am judge of Dallas County Criminal Court number three. It is a misdemeanor bench, and I call it the make a difference bench because maybe we can intervene in the lives of a of an individual or a family and perhaps keep them from going up to what I call the, the advanced floor, which is felony, and um, hopefully maybe um, curb some recidivism. So it's, it's a good place to be for me. I really enjoy it. And I've been, uh, I had my own law firm for about 13, 14 years. And it was a general practice, and I did family, well, domestic relations, which is expensive family law. And I did criminal, wills, trust, and probate, child welfare, and some civil litigation. Awesome. Well, today we're going to talk about, I guess, your former career. And we're so glad that you're one of our judges as a Dallas resident. So happy to have you up there. But um, so to talk about our topic today, which is get paid, have life. So you presented about that yesterday here at the annual meeting, right? Actually, I just presented on that today. Just presented. Yes, yesterday I presented for Texas Center for Legal Ethics (laughs) on implicit bias. That's that's the next podcast we're going to do. And this is why you're one of our rock star favorite mentors. (laughs) (laughs) So to get going with the topics, um, the first thing that I have is, you know, just talking about getting paid and having a life. I guess before you can even get paid, you have to get clients. So do you have a tip for juggling bar service, networking, career? And then my follow-up question to that, because I'm going to let you answer it all at once, is um, do you find that the three go hand-in-hand with helping you get clients? Oh, absolutely. You know, when I got out of law school, I never planned to join a firm. So I was always going to have my own law practice. And I opened my doors in the Turtle Creek area of Dallas, which is sort of a high rent district. So I started out with a little bit of a pressure to make the rent every month. So I knew that I had to go out there and, and get business. But I also love bar work. I had been involved with the bar associations in law school. I was involved with TYLA. I was also involved with the DAYL. I was a a student on their board of directors. And so because I was an older law student, I knew that there was a value of affiliating with people in my profession or my future profession as it was at the time. So when I left law school, I had already established a lot of relationships in the legal field through bar work. And what my plan was, was to have a lawyer referral based law firm. And people say, why? Why you want, you know, why not why not advertising the green sheets? Well, that's not the kind of client I was trying to develop. I wanted clients that had money and paid their bills. <laughs> and what I found is that when lawyers make a referral to you with a client, they usually have some resources because the lawyers I'm talking to are working at firms. And what happens is you have friends that work at big firms and they're doing big firm transactional law and big firm litigation, but they don't do divorces. They don't do traffic tickets. Like I said, they're lawyers, but they're not the kind that help people. So right. when and lawyers make referrals to people that they know, people that they trust, people who they believe are competent. And how does a lawyer know if you're competent, if they can trust you? One, when they see you, one, doing bar work, doing service in the community, and then also they see you at the CLEs in the seminar, so they know that you're staying on top of your legal education and they feel that they can trust you to send their business. And so that's how um, I marry a lot of that bar work and get a return on the investment of my time in bar service in making sure that my referrals were quality. And by quality, I mean paying clients. 
What advice do you have for lawyers that hear what you're saying and that sounds fantastic, but they have no idea how to jump into bar work or community service or something that will help them market to other lawyers? Well, the first thing you have to do is join. Just become a member. Become a member of your local bar association. Find an affinity group that speaks to you in terms of what your practice area is, regardless of what it is. That's one thing. So, for example, if you are doing aviation law, if you have an aviation law section, join that section. If they don't have that section in your local community, they may have it at the state bar level. So join a section also at the state bar level because you really never know. Your referrals, my referrals come from everywhere. Everybody knows somebody in Dallas. They may not like them, but they know them. <laughs> You know, that's a Dallas thing. Who doesn't love Dallas people? Everybody, everybody, <laughs> Sally, everybody, everybody in the world hates the United States. And everybody in the United States hates Texas. And everybody in Texas hates Dallas. Everybody knows that. Except if you live in Dallas. Yeah, well, you know. There's that. <laughs> there's that. But I think I'll tell you one of the one of the traps of bar service, if you do it right, is it's extremely addictive. And you can overextend yourself. And you need to be very careful, especially if you're working at firms. Um, while they will appreciate the relationships that you develop um, and your ability, because at some point, even if you're in a big firm, you may be asked to do client development. We all have to do it in some form or fashion. But you don't want to overextend. You only There are only so many hours in a day. There are 1,440 minutes <laughs> in a day and you need to know exactly how you're spending each one of them and make them all matter and if you overextend yourself you do yourself a disservice you do your firm or your clients a disservice because saying yes to something means saying no to something else and that was something that I really had a lot of difficulty in doing and I, I can certainly and I'm still having a problem with that again it's very addictive because I'm in Bar None the Bar None show in Dallas which raises money for scholarships for um, law students throughout um, the Dallas area North Texas area and also I'm coming down here to speak every day and flying back and forth to make sure that I'm covering all those bases as people ask me to participate and I have a difficult time saying no. So it's important to learn how to set boundaries right. um, on your time and make the appropriate investment. But the first thing I would say do is join. Find a, a section that speaks to your practice area and then find something that doesn't. Because if you do, let's say, family law and you join the family law section, that's great, but you do, you'd be doing better in terms of referral in also joining entertainment law because they'll be looking for resources. They'll be looking for somebody who does something different than what they do. Right. Well, let's talk about getting paid. How do you turn that into money? I mean, you dress fabulous, and we talked about this offline a little bit, but I'm only assuming that you can <laughs> afford that fabulous clothes if your clients are actually paying their bill. So I know Bailey's really involved in her firm, and so she has a lot of experience um, managing clients and dealing with firm agreements. So I'm going to turn it over to her and let her ask some of these questions. I mean, I think my, my first question is you get the you cl get the client in the door, and I think a lot of lawyers, especially you know lawyers that are just going out on their own or younger lawyers in practice, have to figure out how do I keep the client, number one, and number two, how do I actually get them to pay that bill? And I just love your advice for you know, getting paid. Well, that's important because I'll tell you what, you know, people, um, especially new lawyers, they struggle in the area of setting fees, asking for money, uh, and knowing their value, assessing the cost of a matter up front. And I'll say that having a master's in business administration really helped me when I opened my practice. I know a lot of lawyers are not going to have that. But there are a lot of resources to help you. TYLA has law practice in a box. They have a toolkit that is so fantastic. You may have heard of it, Sally. Shout out. <laughs> um, but there are tools out there to help you, and you need to avail yourselves of those so you know how to make a budget and how to know, know what you need to make on each case, how much you need to bring in the door to, to make your life work and to live comfortably and to support your lifestyle. And once you know that when you get a client, when you get a referral, they walk in the door, then you now become a business person. 
Because you, if you think like a lawyer, you're not going to make any money. You got to think like a business person. This is a business. And I know there's, they're out there now saying, I became a lawyer to help people. Yeah, okay. You went and got $100,000 worth of loans so you could what? Not make money? You know, a broke lawyer can't help anybody. And that is a fact. So you want to be comfortable and be okay with with making money and being successful. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing to be ashamed of. But you also don't want to go just solely after the money without thinking of the ethical issues that come with um, trying to go out and just to make money. You still want to provide a valuable service and competent representation to your client. So when you get that client in the door, that client is going to want to know at least two things. One, do you know what you're doing? And two, can you get me out of this mess I'm in? If you can answer those two questions, you will probably have a client for life. And the way you communicate that to a client is not by talking. It's by listening. Your client knows their business way more than you ever will. And you'll be able to develop a strategy a lot better if you listen. You'd be surprised how much you miss because as law students, we're trained to issue spot. So we're picking things out of a conversation. And we've gone, we've run way ahead to get to the conclusion, the resolution, the strategy of how we're going to resolve the matter. And we're missing, and we're missing a lot of the story. What are they, what do they really really want. And when you are selling, because you are selling a service, you're selling yourself to your client. And when you say I dress nice, I appreciate that you, <laughs> that you appreciate the investment I make in my clothes, but my clothes are part of my marketing strategy. Right. Nobody wants a broke looking lawyer. You have to look successful. People will assume you're successful and mentally say, that's the lawyer I want. It's many times I've been walking through the courthouse practicing law and people will say, are you a lawyer? I want you to be my lawyer. And that is simply because of the way I look. A good pair of fishnet pantyhose will take you a long way <laughs> in the hobby have you, seen that, have you seen that meme that just came out that's pretty funny? It's like those old um, 2000 shoes that men wear. And it says, if your lawyer's wearing these shoes, you're guilty. <laughs> if your criminal, shows up, <laughs> yes. your criminal lawyer shows up to court wearing these shoes, you're likely going to be found guilty. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's probably a little accurate, quite frankly. But you do want, you want a successful lawyer. Everybody wants a successful looking lawyer. And so um, that's part of your marketing strategy. But when you get that client in there, and I said earlier that you're selling something, be clear, you're not selling competence because competence is assumed. We all went to law school. We all got a JD. People come to you because they already know you practice a certain area in the law. What you want to sell is compassion. You want to sell the fact that you are interested in that client and in their being successful. And then you need to find out what does that look like to that client. Not to you. I know what intellectually I should expect from a divorce with two kids and a modest amount of property. I know what that looks like to me on paper. But the client has an emotional view of what the outcome of that case is going to look like. A good example is in family law, you have a client that comes in and, and she wants full custody. We know there's no such thing. Nope. Only on TV. Only <laughs> on TV, really. And, and that's not even done well. So we know in the end of the day that that is not going to be a reality. So then you're listening to sort of why does she want that? What does that mean? What is she trying to accomplish? And then you hear in that conversation, there's been some abuse of the child. Now you have a way to address that issue a little bit differently. Or is it parental alienation? There's some jealousy. There's some anger because of the breakup. Now you know how to address that issue. And then you help that client come up with a new reality and a new expectation for the outcome of their case. But at the end of the day, getting that client in the door is only the first step. Then you have to close the deal. You're going to build a rapport. And then you're going to sell them the service and then you're going to close the deal and you're going to get that fee agreement signed in writing. And what do you do whenever you have the problem client who all of a sudden things go downhill and they don't want to pay the bill or you're too expensive or they're complaining? Do you have any tips on dealing with those folks? Well, first of all, I remind them that they knew I was expensive when we met. I love it. (laughs) I am not buy one, get one free. 
that doesn't happen. Yeah. And so I don't negotiate, as I said earlier I, uh, in my CLE, I don't negotiate with terrorists. And sometimes your clients can turn into terrorists because they're going to hold you hostage over their case and your fees. And you're going to feel like you can't escape. But trust me, you can. You should have a fee agreement that explains to a client that if you're not paid, if their retainer agreement is not at a certain percentage at all times, you have the right to withdraw from that case and you will withdraw from that case. And you don't threaten, you do it. You send them that that letter, that 10-day letter saying you're going to withdraw to give them an opportunity to obtain counsel with whom they have a better rapport and may be more affordable. And they'll either pay you or they won't. But if they don't, you need to to exit as soon as possible. So, you know, but you can see it. You can you can see the train wreck coming. If you have a problem client, just document, document, cover your, you know what, and, and communicate with the client. Per our conversation on, this is what we said we were going to do, and just make sure you are communicating. Communication is one of the top areas of complaints with lawyers. And I find that the more you communicate with your client, the better you communicate with your client. You limit those times when you run into train wrecks. Thank you. Well, it looks like we've reached the end of our program today. So I want to thank you, Judge Moorhead, for joining us, for all of your tips that you've given. And I want to thank you, Bailey and Sally, not just for today and for making this such a great experience, but for all your extraordinary leadership in the bar. Really, you all have super bright futures, and I can't wait to see where it's going. It's only because we have real models like you to follow. Exactly. We get to soak up all of your goodness. You You can't tell. (laughs) Just take my word for it. So that's all the time we have for this episode of the State Bar of Texas podcast brought to you by Law Pay. Thank you again, Law Pay, for your sponsorship. Also, thank you to our listeners for tuning in. If you like what you heard, please rate and review us in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcasting app. This is Bailey Rhodes and Sally Pretorius. Until next time, thank you for listening. If you'd like more information about today's show, please visit LegalTalkNetwork.com. Go to TexasBar.com slash podcasts. Subscribe via Apple Podcasts and RSS. Find both the State Bar of Texas and Legal Talk Network on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Or download the free app from Legal Talk Network in Google Play and iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, the State Bar of Texas, Legal Talk Network, or their respective officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, or subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.